And here in the adult class, we do have a follow sheet. It's on that main table if you'd like to pick it up there in the foyer and follow along. We've been in this series, and I believe we're going to wrap this series up today if I can get through all of the notes. Enemies of the soul, enemies of the soul. So our enemies we've been talking about are the flesh, the world, and here the last two weeks we've been talking about Satan or the devil. And last week we kind of delved in a little bit to who Satan is, what he does. Today we're going to continue that discourse, that conversation. So the past week's discussing the flesh, the world, and now we're turning our attention to another enemy of our soul. And often uh, he's the one that we most often think of when we say our enemy, our enemy. But I'm not interested in glorifying or magnifying the devil in our minds. There's nothing there to fear. Um, so, uh, but however, even though we're not going to magnify him or glorify him, we must be aware that we have this enemy, that we have this enemy. And so last week we left off discussing how Satan still has access to heaven. Anybody remember that? Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2, we see Satan in heaven accusing Job before God. And then when we read Revelation 12 and 10, Satan is said to be accusing the brethren or the bride of Christ, the children of God, before God day and night. He's accusing them accusing us. So you have an accuser. Everybody say accuser. You have an accuser. Revelation 12, 10 says, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And so this is foretelling of, of a time when he will be cast down. And we'll talk a little more about that today. But just understand, you have an accuser. Now, in Scripture, there are certain titles that are given to Satan. We want to cover those real quick. If you ever see these titles, they are talking about Satan or referencing Satan. And they're vastly different in some ways. Uh, yet, what they do is they present a complete picture of the one and same adversary. So the first one, point A, that you can write down there on the sheet is Lucifer, Lucifer. Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. So that first title is Lucifer, and we spent a lot of time on that portion of Scripture last week. Uh, but another title that you'll see in Revelation is Dragon, Dragon, the great dragon, the red dragon. And Revelation 12, 3 says, Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads, ten horns, and seven diadems on his heads. Revelation 12, 17, The dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And, of course, this is a picture of him being at war with uh, the offspring of the church, the bride, the mother of us all, the church. And he's at war trying to cut us off. The next term that we have there is Satan. Satan, this most often is associated with his name. Luke 10, 18, he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Revelation 12, 9, so the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. The next term is serpent. Serpent. 2 Corinthians 11 and 3 says, but I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Revelation 12 and 9 is another example. The great dragon was cast out, the certain of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, was cast to earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Actually, I think I 
included that scripture incorrectly. So it doesn't reference him as serpent there, but the word dragon sometimes can be translated as serpent. Uh, the next term, point E, is adversary, adversary. First Peter 5 and 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. 1 Timothy 5, 14, therefore I desire that the younger widows marry, bear children, manage the house, give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully. So we have an adversary. Uh, the final term is devil. Devil, Ephesians 6 and 11, says put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Revelation 12, 9, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So we have some titles there that describe Satan, but we also have some other pictures in scripture that tell us what Satan can be like. Everybody say poser. You know what a poser is. Satan is a poser. He poses as certain things, meaning he's not that thing, but he can pose or position himself to appear to be that thing. The first thing he poses like is a lion. First Peter 5 and 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. Does it say that he is a lion? It says he walks about like a roaring lion. He is a poser, and he tries to appear to be more fierce than he actually is, and he's seeking whom he may devour. And of course, to devour does not mean that he has power to overtake us, but it means in the power of sin, he seeks to devour us because sin is a devourer. It will devour your life. So he roars against the saints, seeking to devour them. Point B, he appears as an angel of light, 2 Corinthians 2, or 2 Corinthians 11 and 14. No wonder for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Remember that he lost his position, he lost his place in heaven. He is no longer that appointed angel, yet he continues to pose himself as an angel of light. So Satan has his angels and they can trans he can transform himself to appear as an angel of light. So the red devil pitchfork bearing, you know, forked tongue, speared tailed thing that you picture most often about the devil is not accurate. He appears as an angel of light. Point C he appears as a minister of righteousness, a minister of righteousness. And here's an important point with this. Let's read the verse first, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen 14 through 15. No wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. So, the picture here is of false ministers, false religions, false teachers, false preachers. And most often time we may think of Christians that preach errored messages, but it also includes all of the religions in the world that are set up to be worshipped. They appear as ministers of righteousness. They establish themselves to be worshipped. So any person who poses as a preacher of righteousness but does not preach the full truth, that's an instrument of the adversary to lead people astray. And that can be within Christianity, false Christianity. That can be in other religions, pointing the way towards something that ultimately leads to a person's destruction. And Paul warned us not to accept any other gospel, either from him from someone else, or from an angel, Galatians 1, 8 through 9. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you, that what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. 
As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you that, than what you have received, let him be accursed. The next thing that Satan appears like is the fowls of the air. That's what Jesus compared him to. He's like a fowl. The devil comes and catches away the seeds or the word of God that is sown in a person's life. Matthew 13, 4 through 19, Jesus gave us the parable of the seeds being sown. It says, as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside. The birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth. They immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground, yielded a crop, some hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus used this, this phrase eight times in the Gospels. So it's important whenever Jesus says this, that we do what? That we listen, we hear, amen? That we hear. And the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? He's answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has to him, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak in parables, because seeing they do not see, hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear, and shall not understand, seeing you will see, and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, their eyes have, they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For assuredly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. Therefore hear the parable of the sower. And verse 19 points out who the fowler is. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. So he's compared like uh, the fowls of the air that pick up the seed. He can come and he can rob of the seed that has been planted. So when you're trying to witness and you're trying to minister and you're trying to sow seed in someone's life, don't be upset. Whenever that seed, you feel like it get ro gets robbed away because Satan will come and he will rob that seed. Point E is that he is a wolf. He's like a wolf. Matthew 10, 16, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. John 10, 12, But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep, and flees. The wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. And what does he do? Hiding his true identity, he comes. That's where we get the term, wolf in sheep's clothing. He invades the flock of God, causing havoc and trouble. And I have learned in my experience in ministry that sometimes good people who get at odds with God can become an instrument of the enemy to sow discord in a church because they're being used in that moment. Some things that Satan can cause according to Scripture. This is according to Scripture. So I know a lot of times we think that uh, this is not possible, or often we look for only reasonable explanations of why certain things happen. But according to Scripture, there are physical impairments that can be brought on by demon possession or oppression. And demon possession means that a person is under complete domination, that they're under possession, being possessed by, or they're being controlled of demons. And that can be mentally, it can be spiritually, it can be physically. Demon possession is not the image, hear me, it's not the image given to it in movies. And if you enjoy that kind of stuff, I'm going to pray that you get delivered because it's not really a joke and it's not entertainment. It's not the image presented in movies and often it is not discernible 
to the human eye. We see it when the demon, when the demon or Satan exposes themselves or through discernment of spirit. Some impairments have been diagnosed as something else when they were the work of Satan. Someone I was close to was getting their degree in counseling, and I can remember having this conversation with them. The uh, instructor brought someone in to present to the class as an example of multiple personality disorder. This person was a pastor. The person taking the class was a pastor, and he said, I've been exposed to multiple personalities. I've seen people with this impairment, this issue. This person did not have that. This person was possessed, and he knew it immediately. His spirit discerned that this was a work of the devil. So there are real impairments, but there are also things that Satan does, and we're going to look at those. So in themselves, physical and mental disabilities do not indicate demon possession. So don't walk around thinking that every physical thing, every mental thing, everything that's happening that you see is all because of the devil. All of them are not. Okay? Well, I want to be clear on that. Does everybody understand that? All right. Good. Last thing we need is people walking around pointing at people and saying, they're blind, they got a devil. But I'm going to show you scriptural examples where blindness is caused because of possession, okay? So, in physical impairments too, this is important to know, Christians can have mental or physical handicaps or be disabled. People can have those things. Such kind of conditions do not prevent salvation, Okay? All right, that's clear. Saints who walk with God, though, we need to understand, saints with walk, who walk with God are not and will not be demon-possessed. Okay? I don't know how many people I've talked to different times in ministry, and they say, I believe I've got a devil. They're not, God and devil are not coexisting in the same body, and you are a vessel of the Lord, okay? So, just understand that. Believers are only at risk of becoming possessed or controlled by the devil only when, only when they continue in sin and turn their lives over to Satan, okay? No one can remove you from the hand of God, the love of God, except for yourself. Say, I do it to myself, okay? No one else can remove you. So this will not happen as long as you are walking in sincerity with God, Bible-based, uh, living, and making an effort to walk with God. Doesn't mean that every, and that, that's another point I should make. Every time you fall in sin, <laughs> you're not opening the door immediately for Satan to come in and take control of your life, okay? If you leave the door open and you welcome him, that's when you're in trouble. So saying someone has a demon is unfair unless it's a known fact, all right? So keep this in, the, in your understanding while observing from the Bible what can and did happen in some lives who were controlled by Satan. Matthew 9, 20, 32 through 35 says, As they went out, behold, they brought to him a man mute and demon-possessed. So muteness, deafness can be a result of Satan's work in a person's life. In verse 33, when the demon was cast out, the mute spoke, and the multitudes marveled, saying, it was never seen like this in Israel. But the Pharisees said, he casts out demons by the ruler of the demons. So there's no misunderstanding what Scripture is saying here. This particular deafness and muteness was exactly caused by demon possession, okay? And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, kingdom healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Not all sickness, not all disease, not all muteness and deafness is called by, caused by demon possession, 
However, these are examples of things Satan has done in people's lives. Mark 9, 14 through 25. And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who is a mute spirit. He has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth and gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. And he answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him. And he fell on the ground, wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he's thrown himself, thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father and the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. So some of the things you see here, the young man is mute, deaf also. And he's also having seizures. He's convulsing. You can see the damage that would be done in a young man's life who is bound in such a way. Another example, Mark 5, 1 through 19, uh, is of mental derangement and lunacy. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes, and when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. No one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always, day and night, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out, cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him, and he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. And he asked him, what is your name? And he answered, saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, send us to the swine, that we may enter them. And what, at once Jesus gave them permission. The unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were all about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it the city and the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. So he had been out of his mind. Jesus delivered him. And now he is in his right mind. So that's another example of what Satan can do in a person's life. Bring upon them mental lunacy, derangement, be out of control. The next point, point D, you can write this down, is another example. I already mentioned this, but blindness, Matthew 12, 22. Then one who is brought to him who is demon-possessed, blind and mute. He healed him so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. Matthew 15, 21 through 23, or not 23, excuse me, 31, give us an example of oppressions and vexations. I'm reading the ESV for easier understanding. Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from the region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, my daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. Notice she was oppressed. Oppressions. And then she describes the oppression, or then Jesus tells her that, no, I'm not going to help you. 
and then she presses him. It's the whole story of crumbs from the master's table. So here's the point. I've known people with these problems who were not under Satan's domination. However, these are examples. Scripture tells us they're examples of what Satan can do in a person's life who is under his control. He can do it with their life and their body. Okay? So he inflicts, and here's the point. This is why he is our adversary. He inflicts much sorrow, suffering, and pain upon humanity. Paul warned us not to give any place to the devil in our lives. And listen, 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 listen. Say that one more time. Listen. Listen. It's not enough for you just to hedge from Satan's work in your own heart and life. If you're a parent here, put boundaries down with your kids, with media, social media, the internet, everything else. Give no opportunity to the devil. You're going to look crazy. Their friends are going to have all the junk in the world, but you want to protect your child, put down a boundary, and be the crazy parent that's called the hover parent. Do it. You'll protect them from a lot of pain, from sorrow, from suffering, if you'll just do that one thing. And it is taxing to do that. I have any parents of adults here or teenagers that you know, it's taxing. My son's 18. He has more liberties now than he's ever had in his life. But it was taxing to get him here. And I can't wait till he graduates high school and I can kick him out of my house. I'm not really going to do that. But I pick at him all the time like it's coming. <laughs> anyway, I'm going back to being serious. Parents, do it. The devil is having a field day in young people's lives that are being exposed to all kind of chaos and confusion in this world, and you have to do it. And if you haven't been doing it, move that boundary. Adjust it now. Don't wait. Tell them, make me the bad guy. Say, Pastor said we're going to do this. Praise God. But Paul warned us, Ephesians 4, 27, give no place to the devil. Place in this verse comes from the Greek word tapas, and it means any portion of space marked off from the surrounding territory. And it's used in the sense of opportunity and power. Give no power to the devil. Give no opportunity to the devil or an occasion for acting. Give him no occasion for acting. And when we as Christians sin, we know that this is not inspired of God. And our action is given place to the devil. That's what we do. We give him an opportunity. And we must turn from that sin. And we are warned against doing this. But in reality, um, all of us know that at some point we will fall. In reality, we know we sin. And we open the door. But we can repent. We can turn to the Lord. And we shouldn't wait to do that. So what should we do if we have given place to the devil? We're to repent to the extent that we have failed. If we've wronged another person or persons, correct forgiveness, correct repentance is that we should seek their forgiveness. We should go to them and we should make it right. That's why Jesus said if you come and you're praying and you have fault with your brother or your sister, you leave your gift at the altar and you go, you leave your worship, you leave your practice, and you go and you talk to them. If only God knows the failure, then we should go to him only. First John 2, 1 through 2, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins not for ours only, but also for the whole world. And, of course, I shouldn't have to say this, but I will say it. You may want, if you have some sin in your life you're trying to get through,
through, get over, reconcile with God over, you may want to consult your pastor or someone in spiritual leadership for instruction, for encouragement, for prayer, for guidance, for accountability. Why? Because we're struggling to overcome temptation in the future. It's not about the past. It's not what has about happened in the past. It's about overcoming for the future. So regardless of how often we fail, we must never quit. So let's talk about Satan's weapons. I think we'll be able to get through this in the nine minutes I have left aloud. Satan's weapons are this. The first, point A, Satan has doctrines, 1 Timothy 4 and 1. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Doctrines. Doctrine, the word doctrine just simply means teachings. So be careful what you just accept, those in university, your learning, higher education, or even in your self-help books. Be careful what you just accept to be absolute truth, because there are doctrines, teachings out there that are in opposition to Christ, and you must know that. Use your discernment the Spirit gives you. If you don't have discernment, pray and ask the Lord for it. He will grant it to you. Satan has fiery darts, Ephesians 6 and 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And uh, Paul was writing here, explaining how using the, a typical thing of the enemy of that day was to light an arrow and shoot it to the enemy so that even if you protected yourself from the arrow, there was a potential of being harmed by the fire. And so we are protected from those things, from not only the arrow, but also the surrounding repercussions of things that happen. Satan has schemes, point C, schemes, Ephesians 6 and 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. If you read this in King James Version or New King James Version, uh, possibly the NIV, it's going to say wiles, wiles. That just means schemes. He is a scheming devil, and he's scheming to get you and your family and any soul that he can. Point D, Satan has devices, 2 Corinthians 2 and 11, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. And Satan tries to use all of these against us. However, God has given us what we need so that we can stand against this enemy and all of his attacks. And so here are our weapons. We've talked about his weapons. Let's talk about our weapons. And it's not trite and simplistic. They matter. God has given us the whole armor of God. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having gird your waist with truth. The truth matters. Look at the world that is abandoning truth and tell me it doesn't matter. Because truth matters. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, your righteousness matters. It means being in a right place with God, living in righteousness. It's part of the armor of God. Removing any piece of this, you expose yourself to the enemy. Verse 15, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this, and with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And what you will notice is that the armor of God does multiple things. It protects your head, that's your mind. Protects your heart and your body, right? Covers you. Uh, It girds you with truth 
and it protects your feet, which represent what? The places you go, where you walk. You can walk in unpeaceful situations, situations that are not filled with peace, and have peace. You can stand facing the enemy with faith and the sword of the Spirit and take on the enemy because you have been wrapped in the armor of God. Amen. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, uh, he gives more instruction. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, cast down, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought, your mind, again, we're back to the mind, thought into captivity to the disobedience of Christ. The next weapon we have is his word, Scripture. Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Jesus was led by the Spirit to the wilderness, be tempted by the devil. When he fasted 40 days, 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you're the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. He answered him and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And if we continued reading there, I won't for the sake of time, but we see that every temptation, every attack, every argument Satan brings, he refutes with the word of God. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Point C, fasting coupled with prayer can defeat and cast out demonic prayers. Matthew 17, 21, however, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. James 4 and 7 says we must first submit to God. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submission to God puts us in a spiritual position to resist the devil, causing him to flee from us. We're not submitted to God. We have no reason to believe the devil should flee from us. Submission is an important, important aspect of our life with Christ. 1 Peter 5 and 9, resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Even when we suffer, we need to be submitted to God. And sometimes submitting leads us into suffering because Christ deems so. Every Christian should acquaint themselves with these weapons. And we should learn to use them effectively. And with victory, Romans 16.20 says that we'll bruise, that victory will bruise Satan under our feet. God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So I'm going to hurry through this last part because we have just a few minutes left. But know this, Satan's destiny, his fate is already determined, and it's been sealed for a long time, and Satan knows his destiny. He is aware of it. Matthew 8, 28 through 29, when he come to the other side of the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs exceedingly fierce so that no one could pass that way, and suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time. What, is he saying? what were they saying? We know what's coming. We're going to be tormented. It's already determined. So, it's important to know, God made a promise in Genesis 3.15. I'll put enmity, enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And God will fulfill it. Now, that looks ahead to the cross. But ultimately, God will fulfill the promise. Revelation 20, 1 through 10. I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones that sat, they sat on them, 
and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who is part who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went, on the, they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven, devoured them. The devil, verse 10, who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So at that point, Satan will lose access to heaven and no longer accuse the brothers and sisters in Christ. Revelation 12, 3 through 9, we won't read it. I'm already over my time. And he will be bound in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. He'll be released for a th- after a thousand years. And he'll return to the earth and go forth to deceive nations to gather them against the saints. And then at that point, Satan and all who follow him, when they gather together against the saints, they have a terrible fate awaiting them. And here's an important thing to understand. Hell was not prepared for humanity. Hell was not prepared for humanity. It was prepared for the devil and the fallen angels. Matthew 25, 41, Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. It was never intended that humanity be placed there. However, humans who refuse obeying God's word, don't submit, will go into the lake of fire. But this does not have to be anyone's fate. It doesn't have to be. And we need to be passionate about reaching all. God has given us everything we need to defeat our enemy and to lead others, if they're willing, to be delivered from the same fate that the devil has coming. If you'll stand with me, we're going to pray. Kids are already coming out of their class. We'll take a little break. Um, If you have not, there are pastries in the back. You can enjoy a pastry. There's also some coffee back there. Get your energy up, because we're going to be doing some worship. Amen. All right. Uh, let's pray and ask the Lord to give us wisdom and guidance in dealing with the enemy that comes against us, whether it's the flesh, the world, or Satan. Lord, we thank you so much for your word that is truth, that is life. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you would help us, God, to obey your word, to live faithfully according to it, regardless of what everyone around us is doing. And help guide us, God. Give us a spirit of discernment that we can see where the enemy is at work in our lives and around us. God, help us to have the fortitude and the strength, Lord, to stand and resist and to submit our lives to you so that we can have the benefit of all that you offer us of protecting us from the enemy and making us strong. We give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody say in Jesus' name and say amen. You know, amen just means let it be, so be it. That's what it means. Whenever you say amen, 